Show of hands, anyone? Well, I guess everyone here has super no Databricks. Hands up if you don't know Databricks. Everyone knows. Hands up if you don't know Delta. And hands up if you don't know Delta Live Tables. So there's a few. All right, so we, we get there. Um, so my name is Wong. I'm a CS Solutions Architect at Databricks. Uh, and today, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about, I guess, one of the really cool features or parts of the platform um, called Delta Live Tables. And they realize we, because Delta Live Tables, the acronyms become DLT. And people are like, what do you mean by DLT? Like, does it have anything to do with ETL, ELT? Um, so, you know, then I realized, should I go declarative ELT pipelines with you know, DLT? Because that sounds like a more fun one. But let's not go there. So, what we are going to talk about. So live as a data professional, right? Um, how many of you have had these kind of requests, right? You know, we've got a bunch of data, sits somewhere in the storage account, and they need to turn it into really nice reports. And obviously, you list all the files, data's there, your raw data, with some wizardry, you turn that into a nice dashboard, you know, with some stats, some aggregations. That's great, right? Um, how about we repeat that 10 times? And then, but from that, you know, we build some queries, we build some dashboards. How do we turn that into actual ETL pipeline? So the standard one people use, Spark, with, you know, Delta, obviously, because it's like Parquet, but faster. And then the side effect is you have a bunch of nice things on top of that. Um, and then you, you know, create a query like that, CTA statement, and then you build another table as, you know, select from those data, right? Typical medallion architecture. And we got that. Nice. And then it's like, okay, how about we do this every day? Can you make this into a job that runs every day? You're like, okay, fine, I go and do it. How about every minute? Because I have a really important project and I want to watch the dashboard refresh every minute. It's like, okay, that's great. So really, the reality as a data professional is that you get one of these. And then what well, you need to add, you know, so you need to add how are dependency management, right? how do you manage the libraries, how you deal with like daily petitions. So how do you, recom do you recompute everything or do you only append the new ones? Uh, do you do an upsert, a merge, et cetera? Uh, for folks who use streaming, right? And I like to describe streaming to people as these are more just incremental. Think of it as incremental, right? I, I know exactly where I've stopped so I can resume exactly from where I left off, which is really what a stream is. Um, so how, you know, how can I do checkpointing so that I know exactly where to resume from? And how can I do a retry? So if my pipeline fails, I can retry it, but how do I make sure that I don't have a duplicate data, and make sure I have essentially item potency? And then, you know, people want to do quality checks, governance, data discovery, all on top of that. And that is a lot. And then the X ops, right? You know, people want to have deployment infrastructure, people want to have version control on that. And I think I need to go on some sort of, uh, where's my mouse? You know what, I'm just gonna keep going. So actually the operational complexity happens all outside of your logic. So you know, how do we make that a little bit easier? Because reality, you should focus on that. You know, just really how you model your data. And that's probably the most important thing, right? everyone talk about data models. And from that, and, it is? Yeah, it is. It is still working, which is good. And my slide is stuck, which is fun. And let's go with that. So what Delta Live Tables is really, people have been using Databricks for a long time, and we realize there's a lot of complexity around that. So how about we introduce a framework that allows you to build your production pipelines by just adding live syntax to your queries. Kind of simplifying it, you know, plus some more, right? There's always the small prints, so maybe I should put it really small at the bottom here so people don't realize it. So it's not as simple as adding live, but it's very close. So we talk about live table, right? Because the word delta live table, people are like, what do you mean by delta live table? Like, what does that even mean? So actually, it's about you tell the framework, what your table is, and we keep it live, so we keep it f as fresh as possible. 
So think about it as like a materialized view. We want to define a query and the pipeline, make sure that it's created and kept up to date. So materialized views, you know, people using database with Dell. And essentially, once you define what your table should look like, you know, for example, you want to have your report table as a two column, you know, sum of profit from sales table, you know, maybe grouped by certain columns, right? And you don't want to have to figure out the logic on how to keep that one up to date. You just want, every time you run your pipeline, that report table is an aggregation of the sales table. And you leave the framework to deal with you know, the operations, how to scale to achieve you know, the latency de desired. And ultimately, you know, then you can put control, quality control and everything on top of those. So simple enough. And then we have streaming live table. So what is streaming live table? And this is where people ask me, OK, what is streaming? You know, what do you mean by that? And a streaming live table is a stateful. We talked earlier about it. It's incremental, right? It keeps track of exactly where it finishes. So think of a daily ingestion of uh, transactions. You don't want to re-ingest all the transactions the day before. And the classic case is someone would put a filter on for the day. And then the pipeline stops running over the weekend because some reasons no one, no one has come in to fix that. Oh, then so I need to rerun my pipeline three times now, each with a different day. And some poor cell hard coded as a today date, and you know, like I'm going to change the time zone on my machine so that it runs with the Saturday date, and you know, things fall apart. Um, so, streaming lab table is really about incremental processing, and it's get it to ensure exactly one's processing, and you know, you want the append only type data. And this basically, you know, reduce cost, but it also improve latency. And the syntax is like, you know, create streaming live table. And this is where there's some special source from the Datrix platform. Cloud files is a shorthand for, and, and this is where I don't agree with product marketing. They call it cloud files in the product, and then the product marketing call it auto loader. But cloud files is basically here's a bunch of files in a folder, only retrieve the one that has arrived and ignore everything you have read, and you keep track of it. So you basically get your incremental ingestions of files into a storage account reliably, because it essentially keeps track, it has, a mini, it has an embedded database that keeps track of which file has been processed and which one has not. So no more having to figure out which file has arrived and which has not, and you can run it on a daily basis, for example, so you don't have to trigger the pipeline every time a file arrives. Um, and you can scale it out to you know, more streaming framework, uh, or what we would call it is like queuing, you know, like Kafka Kinesis Event Hub, obviously. You know, you've got events coming in, and we process them as well. So then how do you use it? You know, it's like, all right, sounds good. And three steps, really. Um, first, you write your definitions. So because we talk about declarative, right? this is declarative, so you declare your data model, and you, 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 you create your definitions. Databricks, we like notebooks, so we like people to create the definition in a notebook. And obviously, you can source control, version control that using the repos functionality. But effectively, you define, you, you build your data model. And then you create a pipeline referring to those notebooks as your pipeline. So the pipeline is what executes, what kept the model up to date. Right? The notebook is just where the model gets stored. And then you just start. And every time you start, the pipeline runs. And every time it runs, it makes sure that the model is up to date. So that's why it's live tables, because it keeps the table fresh and live. Um, so yeah, the theory is simple, right? Um, so you could create, so the, the, the classic example is I have a bunch of log files coming in, JSON files that arrives. My first table would be create live, a streaming live table bronze logs as select, you know, star from cloud files with the path and a bunch of parameters to specify that I'm doing JSON um, inference. My next table will be, you know, create silver as, you know, select from stream bronze because I only want to process the new data and I do some transformation potentially. And then I, once I define that model, I just run my, create my pipeline and run it. And, you know, and I can set you to run it once a day 
once every hour, hopefully have a happy customer at the end that you know have the data in the dashboard. Theory simple for now. And because of the way it's worked, uh, what is built in is there's a development mode where we keep a, because how it is defined as a model, we keep a long running cluster to make sure that you, you update your model and then you rerun the pipeline, you can validate quickly, right? One of the, I guess, long running problem in Databricks is because you have to wait for the VMs to get a cluster you do have to wait you know, a few minutes, right? As you, I think, notoriously sometimes makes you wait 10 minutes for a cluster to, for a VM to be available. Um, and we don't retries on error so that you can debug faster. Obviously, keyword for this is this will probably go away eventually once we go to, once we have more serverless uh, capabilities, then you don't have to worry about the, you know, waiting five minutes for a cluster to start up. Uh, production mode, on the other hand, turn off the clusters you know, as soon as the pipeline is done. But it also does escalating retries, and this is probably the, f the, the most interesting part. So you know how sometimes you're like, I run my pipeline, right? And it failed because of, um, could be arbitrary reason. You know, suddenly there's a shortage of VMs in the region, you couldn't get one. Suddenly, you know, your data source is down, so you couldn't reach out and fetch it. So how do you configure the retries? And Delta Lab Table, a pipeline actually automatically gets retries if it fails and we have exponential back off. So it retry, and then it waits a bit longer, and it retries again. And if it can't, it restart the cluster. So basically, it makes sure that there is reliability in the phase of transient issues. And my favorite example is when you're doing um, schema, when you're having schema inference with cloud files, when there is a schema changes, in, because we, inf we can infer all the JSON files for a schema, for a common schema, but if they're new, JSON that comes in changes your schema. Spark is not designed to deal with that, so it would fail, and you have to restart the stream. So now, normally, when you do that, you have to configure your job to have retries, but that's not very smart. DLT actually automatically retries. It notices that there's a schema ch changes. It fails the job quickly, restarts it immediately, and it doesn't present it as a failure. So actually, when you look at operational log, it's just a successful run. So you don't have noise in your logs, which is really cool. What else? Um, so we talk about the theory, you know, simple example, right? What happens if you have a lot of tables? Or, you know, so you can define dependencies between them. So I creating a table, there's, you know, uh, events from the raw data, but this is coming from prod. But what happens if you want to define dependencies between the tables in my pipeline? So actually, there's a, depend there's a virtual schema called Live that allows you to build dependencies uh, between the tables in a pipeline. And when DLT detects the dependencies, it makes sure that the order of executions are correct. So a table gets updated, the downstream table then gets updated, and it, if there are multiple tables in parallel, it makes sure those are run in parallel. And you really don't have to worry about Oh, I need to run you know three queries in parallel because these tables you know only depend on the same table upstream. I have to wait for the other one. You don't have to handle a lot of that logic in your code anymore. Uh, DLT automatically figure that out, and it because of that because of the way you model your data, you get the lineage right because you my bronze table that then that has transactions now become you know three silver table. Each you know one is the valid transactions, one is potentially errors, and the one that has failed for example, and you get all of that uh, out of the box. But it's also because it's the way you model it. You know, we already figure out the dependencies. What else do we talk about? But then, do you put all your data table in one pipeline? You probably won't. And this is where, in Delta Lab tables, you can have multiple pipelines, and you can break up your pipelines, you know, your, your data model at the natural boundary, at the natural division. So. We, we do suggest like, you know, maintaining quite a few tables in the same pipeline because that reduces your complexity in orchestration, you know, because otherwise you have to build extra orchestration steps. Right? DLT handles a lot of that magically. But also, if you build the boundary where like, the team boundaries are, or where the application specific, where the domains are, you know, the data managers fan, you know, you love the word domain, people like domain. So if you break it up there, each team would be responsible for their own set of pipelines. 
and you get, it's manageable, but each team would benefit from the dependencies management, you know, within Delta Lab tables. There's a, and also there's a technical reason, which is if you think of a cluster in Databricks, that's a Spark cluster, there's a kind of an upper limit of how many tables you can chain or how many queries you can run at the same time. So if you are throwing, well, I mean, I uh, recently have an example, like someone trying to throw a thousand tables all in parallel with it, you, know, you basically end up killing the cluster because the utilization shoots through the roof. Um, so there are some, this is more forward looking. Uh, so there are plans to have ability to have multiple clusters backing these. And again, DLT's job is to help divide up the tables. But for now, you know, think of this as you have tables you build into a pipeline and you can be quite strategic into how you segregate them. And actually, when you don't have to worry too much about you know, how to build all the dependencies in parallelism management, you can spend time on this. And so when I mentioned earlier about like, you know, the, the fact that you can auto scale, right? this is actually really cool. So Delta Lab tables, you can specify the minimum and maximum number of nodes, and it aggressively adds resource and free up resources as and when needed, obviously people using Databricks, you know that we have the auto-scaling in the interactive cluster, in the job cluster. Caveat is that those work, there's some rudimentary algorithm and behind that, you know, in terms of look at the Spark plan and look at the execution. DLT is smarter, as we like to call it, because it has an external monitoring service. It actually captures more um, metrics and more stats so that it will make, I guess, more enhanced auto-scaling decisions. And this is particularly useful when you have things like streaming workloads, where you know, it fluctuates, where you have like, your files arriving at different rates throughout the day. You might have fluctuating volumes depending on the week of the day. Auto-scaling in DLT works really well, so you can have a robust reaction to the data you know, that the volume of data that arise. Um, and actually, one, one, I think, well, one of the customers that I was working, I've been working with over the last year, so they, they start out with a structured streaming job, and they, once they switched to Delta Live tables, I think they managed to cut it down by a third, because at peak, it's the same cluster size, but because DLT is very aggressive in terms of how it scales overall throughout the day, you know, it, the, 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 the resource uh, tracks the data profile a lot closer, which is really cool, in my opinion. Right, who doesn't want to save some money? And so how do you would develop then, right? So we, you write queries, you put them into a pipeline, and you run them. It's like, right, theory is nice. Uh, but you know, people would have various environment, right? You need CI, CD consideration. You need isolated environments. So how do we do that? And in DLT, it has a parameter called targets, and the target is where the pipeline should publish the tables to. And this is kind of a, what I would describe as, it's a, it, it is a decision on purpose. You know, we, we, we purposely do this because you can have the same pipeline publishing to different targets. So you can have a pipeline publishing to dev, so you can run that on your dev workspace, and you can have a pipeline that publishing to staging. So you could even run out of the same workspace, technically, but you can have that publishing to staging. So, and you can configure the pipelines you know, in staging to look at only the staging data set, in dev to look at the dev data set, and you can run valid further validation without actually changing your code. So your data model is consistent between the environments, and this is where you know, declarative is really cool. Um, so think of you know people writing things like this, right? They would create or replace table prod dot report as you know select the right answer. Uh, obviously, that means that a struggling developer would write that something like that, and what that means is now you're overwriting the wrong table, and now that's your production table, right? So someone have to review and do all of that. DLT can help do that by using the live keyword because it's a virtual schema, and where you publish your data is a pipeline level parameter. So what you can have is 
create live table you know, and build dependencies on a previous table that's also in the same pipeline, when you publish it to the dev pipe, you know, when you create a dev pipeline with a different target, it's now writing to the dev report. And obviously, the struggling developer who wrote the wrong code can't impact the production environment. So we, there's already isolation built in. Makes our life a lot easier. We're a lot happier. I think this is cool. Right? I, think, I think a lot of things are cool. And obviously, you can have version control as well. So you have a, 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 the same code base. And because it's notebooks, but notebooks in Databricks are just basically a bunch of codes. So it gets ch checked into your repo with a, a, a magic header. So actually, you can version control that. So that makes sure your production job is the same as your development pipeline. You know, your production job is now using the actual production pipeline definition. And you get all the good results, all the happy, you know, very happy days. Uh, there, there's usually a couple of slides with like the best practice on top of that, right? Because a lot of these is kind of designed on purpose so that we can achieve this. Fun fact, internally at Databricks, we use Delta Lake tables for all our like, internal data processing. I think a lot of them, maybe not all of them, but it's like you, you dog food your own product. I guess that's, that's the way I, I would describe that. Um, so how do you know your results are correct? And this is where we, 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 we mentioned uh, there's a, earlier there's a box about you know, how you do quality checks on your data. Right? And uh, there are tools out there that talk about data, data observability, but a lot of the observability is done post hoc. You've done it after you've done your processing. So uh, my wife works for you know, is an analytics engineer, and she frequently gets uh, slack escalation, pager duty escalation from you know, a tool that monitors. Right? But like, your pipeline runs for three hours, and now you've got a bunch of wrong results. And now it starts alerting you. I'm like, OK, so how is that helpful? Because now you're going to go and have to unroll everything. Can you put checks while you develop, you know, while you're running your pipeline, while you're doing your ETL? And really, um, there, there's something in DLT called expectations, which allows you to have tests directly on your data sets as you're doing pipeline. Level set expectation, this is not going to be the, bullet, the silver bullet for everything. This works on row based level, so it, it checks. You know, it, it, does, um, it, it validates record per record, so it can't do, it can't do clever things like if, if, this val if this value is below the median of you know, all the existing data, then throw it out. That requires a little bit more work, because then you have to build the aggregation table to figure out which row has violated the aggregation level. But on a record uh, level, it's really good. Um, the other thing that's missing is that it doesn't have a built-in quarantine yet, so you end up having to create two tables, one with the rule and one with the opposite of the rule, so that's one quarantine table. So I'm saying it's good, it's not great. You know, when they say it's cool, it's like it's great. When they say it's good, it's good. You know, I'm not here to sell, right? So when it's great, it's um, and it's cool. I think probably next level. Uh, but this is you know easy if you want to put in validations. You know, you don't want your logs to, you don't want your transactions to suddenly have you know eight-figure digit in, in 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 the value, for example, without alerting, and DLT then keep track of the records, and it shows you right in the operation screen as well. Um, and you can build that in SQL. And there's a like a spoiler alert here. I keep showing SQL because there's a more cool thing. Um, but you basically build a constraint. Like, you know, I expect the number of entries is one. And, I can, and this is what I refer to, right? You can build further aggregates that serves as tests. So you can test directly in your pipeline. So for example, I want to make sure that my Primary key is unique. Don't shoot, don't shoot the messenger. You know, we, you don't do primary key enforcement in an analytical database, because otherwise you shoot your performance. But you can have validation like this, so that when you ingest your data, you make sure that your validation, you, know, you validate, and you make sure you're actually, we don't enforce it during RAR, but we can enforce it immediately after and fail the pipeline if it fails. And I think you know, this is the acceptable, right? Because you don't want to kill your performance, but you still want some sort of checks and control. And you know, we can do things like that. You know, com compare two tables to make sure that you don't have any. You know, uh, the, the 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 primary key and foreign key constraints are correct. So you, know, you can do a left outer join, right? Obviously, and check that the the join key is not null. Yeah. You know, so you can do basically SQL is powerful, and you can do a lot of powerful stuff with SQL using this. 
And this is you know, the spoiler, right? What if you need more than SQL? Because you know, SQL rules the world until you can't use SQL anymore. And what do you do? Um, Python. Python then. Why do you have to learn a new language? You know, we, we, uh, Databricks don't like to create randomly new language because we believe that people should use like Python and SQL and Scala for the odd ones out there. Um, but you want, to write adva you want to write your data frame code? Yes, you can. And it's basically using built-in Python decorators. So basically, there's a decorator called dlt.table, and you add that to a function that returns a data frame. We then infer that that is a table, we're gonna, and that's your model. Um, you can mix and match different notebooks as well. There's a limitation. You can't mix and match within a notebook, but you can um, mix Python notebooks and SQL notebooks. There's a bit of an annoyance one. Like It's just how they parse the notebooks. But you can build you know, your Python data frame, right? So people who are doing DF equals spark.read stream or spark.read, you're good. You're covered. Um, you don't have to learn SQL completely. Um, and you know, we can, we can, because of the power of PySpark, you can do like string generation. So you can generate strings, which is kind of cool. But also, I hate people who generate F string of SQL that are like 200 lines. And you can't debug what's going wrong because it's too complex. Got a question here. Will the single limitation in the future be removed? The single limitation. Will the, yeah, will the single limitation being removed? So there's a few single things here. I think the notebook one, it's almost just do we prioritize it enough to remove that? There's a single schema one before, you know, where we can only publish to one schema. That is being worked on, but apparently when you code when you build something with one with one design in mind, and you have to untangle that. It apparently takes a little bit longer, and there's a lot of things people want in Delta Lab table. So hopefully that answers the question. So. Another question is the Delta Live table technically the same as a normal Delta table. Can I upgrade, from a, can I upgrade the data from a normal Delta table to a Delta Live table? Ooh, tough question. So the question is, is a Delta Live table a Delta table under the hood? And can you upgrade a Delta table into a Delta Live table. Uh, I always have a short version and a long version, right? Because the name says Delta. It is a Delta table under the hood. There's some more advanced tricks further down that we explain. It's actually building a view on top of a Delta table, but there's still a Delta table underpinning that. Then people are asking, oh, what about if I don't want to publish to a Delta table? Again, we cover that a bit later. And can you upgrade one? So there is a concept of like you can get Delta a pipeline to take over an existing table, but there's a rule saying that it has to be a streaming table because a streaming table is a you know it's stateful, whereas a live table or a materialized view it will overwrite your data. So it's one of those where here's a gun, here's your foot, don't shoot your foot, but if you you know if you're not very careful you will shoot your foot. So I guess. Double, like just double check it, but yes, it can take over, but it can take over in a hostile way that you didn't expect to. But like technically, that's how it should be. Like a materialized view, it would just overwrite the views, it will overwrite your table if it thinks that it needs to make sure the results are correct. So I think that's. I have one more question. When we validated, when we evaluated Delta Live Table six to twelve months ago, the Databricks version was behind, missing, for example, identity column. Is that better now? So. Again, this is one. So at the moment, we, we track usually about, because Delta Live Table fixed the Databricks runtime version, mostly for stability reason. We usually run about one version behind. So, the, so at the moment, like the latest runtime is 12.2, I think, uh, or 12.0 something, 12.2. And Delta Live Table is on 11.3. So it tracks about a version behind. The preview channel tend to be a bit faster. Again, we cover the current and preview channel. So the question about you know Delta Live Table missing features like you know identity column for example that are dependent on the runtime uh, it will catch up. So for example at the moment a lot of the features that was missing about six months twelve months ago have now caught up. Now we've got a different problem because there's a bunch of very cool features released in twelve like we are now able to uh, um, to decode protobuf in streams instead of just JSON and, you know, and Avro. And people are like, oh, when can you get protobuf? Because we, you know, we got DLT, we do our streaming, but we stream protobuf. It's like, yes, wait like a month or two. But we, we get there. Like, it, it's always, it always tracks about a version behind. So you usually take about a month or two for it to catch up. 
So hopefully that answers the question. I think we're good. Um, so Python and SQL, right? So back to this. So Python is powerful, right? I guess hands up if you, well, Python over SQL, Python, hands up if you think Python is more, well, if, if, you, if you're more comfortable with Python, I'm trying not to create a flame war here. Right. Um, so with Python, what you can also do is you can pip install libraries. So you, know, you can install your wheel, if you have like your modules and all that, and you can pip install you know, like various libraries from PyPy, for example. And this is cool, in my opinion. But this is, this is the coolest part. You can do metadata programming, metadata-driven programming or metaprogramming. So you, again, using Python, and, and this is where people, some people get it slightly wrong, but you need, because it's a decorators, you need closure. And Python is weird with closure, so I don't want to spend half an hour debating about that. But effectively, you can have a list of table names with you know, different parameters, and you can construct them like this. And what this would do is that basically I would have a list of tables, and I can build each of them will have a different report. And you, know, you can look at like schema registries, you can look at, you can have, have a table that acts as a driver. And here's an example. If you have CDC streams coming from an operational database that you need to process, there are hundreds of tables. Do you really want to write 100 pipelines to manage that? With DLT, you can write about 50 lines of code, and you get all 100 tables, and you can run them. And it will run actually 100 of them in parallel. It's kind of cool, just saying. What about operations, so, you know, operational day to day? So here's a UI. Here's what it looks like. So you can see we have the tables, we have the dependencies, the graph, and you can see the data quality stats. And you know, it's intuitive as a UI, obviously, and you, you, know, you can start your table. Um, you can visualize data flows, obviously. You can look at the metadata. You can look at historical runs as well. So you basically can see previous pipelines, whether they're successful or not. You can have controls over you know, when you want to start something, when you want to do a full refresh. So you think that this is completely broken. I want to start from scratch. You can full refresh, and you can change the settings, uh, access controls. And you, know, you can dive into the events. And this is probably the, the, the fairly interesting part. The event logs in Delta Lab tables. So remember when we talk about observability and how you want to monitor your job, is I guess hands up if you think you have very good handling on how you monitor your jobs. No hands. This is good. Anyway, but I, I, I profess I don't, I, I don't think I put my hand up either. But you can have operational statistics. You can have, you know, provenance. You can have data quality metrics as part of an event log. An event log in the Delta Live table publish is basically just a Delta table. So you have, another, you have a Delta table that contains all of these metrics, which means you can build, you can stream that out to things like Datadog and Grafana. You can build alerts, and you can visualize it and put dashboards on top of those as well. Um, this is probably underlooked by a lot of people start using Delta Live tables. Uh, you know, at, at the beginning, right? Because you see that the event log in the UI, and you're like, oh, this is cool. But it's like, actually, you know, behind the UI is actually there's a log that you can read from and you can work with. So how do we handle failures? You know, we talk about the automa automatic failure recovery. We have escalating retries. You know, transactionally, we do make that sure that the tables, transactions are atomic. It's kind of a side, it's, it's a benefit you get with Delta table. The Kind of a com common complaint that I have, so just, just, just you know, stopping this before people start asking questions. Is like multiple tables in a pipeline, we don't guarantee the atomic updates in one pipeline, in one update. So there's a best effort to update as far as possible. So you might have table out of sync, you know, because if there's a failure, we stop at that point. Anyway, that so we. There's work being added to that, but that's a fundamental challenge when you have tables as far as on cloud storage. Having a multi-table transactionality is kind of a big project. So just stopping people before they, you ask me, can you do, you know, can you do multi-table transactions? Can DLT guarantees all that? It's like, uh, not really, but you know, eventual consistency, right? If you live with eventual consistency, you'll be happier, because if you expect higher consistency, you tend to have high expectation, which is harder to manage in this one. Uh, what, what do I no longer need to manage with DLT? And this is, you know, 
We have that picture before, right? So what do I do? you don't need to manage? So actually, you don't need to manage a lot of the data management anymore. You don't have to worry too much about schema evolution. You know, you if you modify the transformation, we automatically try to do the right thing. We do things like vacuuming and optimizing. So folks who are using Delta then have to set you like optimize and z-ordering job. You can define that as part of your Delta uh, or your tables in Delta Lab tables, and it will runs these job in the background. And obviously, you know, you don't really have to tune a lot of your, like when, when you're writing out, you don't have to specify a lot of configs, you don't have to tune the cluster as much as possible. It, it tries to be as clever. Um, and parameters, and this is the other part, right? So we talked earlier about there's a target which specifies the schema, but what happens if you have other parameters? Actually, you can just put them as pipeline parameters here, and you can just use them as either spark.conf.get or in SQL is basically this dollar sign with a little bracket. Um, and what that means is you can make sure your code is more readable, is more maintainable, and you can reuse it. You know, with different scenarios, you can actually use parameters for even like in testing, you might want to mock, have mock data sets elsewhere. So typical example is like in your real time, you might want to have Kafka, but who wants to spin up multiple Kafka environments for you know, all the different environments? So can we mock the validation in dev with just tables, you know, CSV or Delta table, instead of having to do all of that? So uh, what you don't want to do is don't use parameters to control the execution because we're going to replace the whole table. So this is kind of a, yes, it is kind of powerful, but it's kind of a gun meat food situation again. Because if you're trying to specify execution parameters, you're going to end up losing your table. So what you want to do is, you know, you, like it, it will try to do the right thing and it will basically delete all your data. Again, think of it as, as, a, as a declarative. You're declaring what you want it to do. The end goal would look like what you declare. It's not operation. So you don't feed parameters to control like backfilling as such. Um, what you want to do instead is doing things like you know, reducing volumes when you're doing dev work, for example. You don't want to ingest the full 90 days of data. You only ingest 15 days of data. You can configure those like, intervals as parameters. What else can you manage with DLT? Here's some cool tricks. You can put attributes. So you know, with Delta tables, you can put different properties. right? You can put them as part of the pipeline a definition, and we'll manage that. You can put comment. Um, if you are using Databricks, uh, table access control, you can define the grant in here as well. And um, so there's some cool tricks. You can define you know, a lot of attributes there. Um, I wouldn't call this would do all the governance and discovery. You know, it's kind of overrated in my opinion, but it's a nice trick to keep your data sets clean. Right? You want to add comments and other attributes that makes it slightly easier, makes your life easier, but I don't think it will solve all your discovery problem. That's my opinion. Uh, but you can define things like, Delta properties, you know, for Delta Lake, for like retention, um, you can control how, like Z ordering, for example. So that would happens right in here as well. So again, it's like, you know, when, when we talk about infrastructure as code, this is pipeline as code. This is cool, um, and you can have, uh, you know, more things like, you know, we, we what do we suggest is like, you know, having key value pairs, uh, so you can have properties. Uh, obviously, there's. Part that there are work in the product to like you know make tagging a first class citizen rather than having weird key value embedded here. So maybe next year I come to you and I would exp I would talk to you a much better version of this. Orchestration. Um, skip this one relatively quickly, but effectively, if you want to, if you're using Databricks workflows, I guess hands up if you use Databricks workflows. It's like no hands. Well, there's like a few. Uh, but effectively, it's like a lightweight workflow is built into Databricks, so you can chain up your pipelines in Databricks as well. Uh, you could use ADF to trigger some of these, but it's a bit clunky in my opinion. Like Workflow does it uh, relatively easy out of the box um, for you. And that means you can have multitask, right? Well, multi-pipelines to multitask. Um, but then this is my favorite topic that you just talk about, right? When you start getting into more complex, it's like, what, what is streaming? What, what should you do, right? And structured streaming, and really what we're talking about is append-only table. So, you know, files uploads to cloud storage, Kinesis, Event Hub, you know, messaging buses, and Delta Live table that's only been appended. 
and maybe transaction lots of databases. So we can, pro we, can pro uh, we can process data as it arrives. Obviously, you don't have to wait until all the data has arrived to process them. And that's structured streaming for you. That's like a one-on-one -on -one structured streaming. Right? Anyone want to take a photo of that in case someone asks you, what does streaming do? It's like that. It's not streaming. Like it, yes, it can be used for real time, but it's not that crazy. So that's what I mentioned about right? using cloud files. It helps you scale, and it obviously keeps track to avoid duplication. It, guarantees exactly once, there's a caveat there, is that, well, there's no caveat, it, it guarantees exactly once, same with Kafka, same with Event Hub. So actually, you get a lot of nice syntactic, um, well, I guess complex things out of the box nicely. And you can do things like that with Kafka, right? So you can read from a Kafka source and um, automatically write to a table. This is quite clever. And obviously, you can then use a stream to basically read the new records only instead of doing a snapshot. So this is like you can chain your streams, which again is you know more efficiency, cost savings. And obviously, Delta can you, you can do sort of infinite retention. Again, this is where I would say it's okay. Like if you're trying to keep it for too long, you do get performance issues. But you could use Delta to cheaply retain a lot of history. And you can still do things like delete you know, the data, erase the, the old data as well. And you know, this is what I mentioned about, right? Streaming doesn't have to be expensive. You can do it in trigger mode. So you can schedule on a regular job, rather, on a regular basis, rather than having to continuously run them. Because they are, you, know, you, you don't need to run it every time you want. Right? You want to do streaming just to benefit from the checkpointing, actually, the incremental. Incremental checkpointing equals streaming. And when you should use chain streaming, again, you, know, you can chain multiple streaming jobs so that you can build you know, your table, your transformation. Uh, when you're trying to do updates in streaming, you will break the downstream computation because if you're trying to delete and update those, so this is where I say not cool, like you do have to watch out what you're doing with that. Come to me later with questions on this one because I don't want to spend a lot of time trying to explain all the nuances here, but this is uh, things that people do run into. And there's, we are working on something in very short term to fix some of this, like in case you've actually done something wrong, can we unblock you? And this is probably the, this is some more advanced technique, right? How can you deal with, how can you do merge? And a lot of merges is basically how do you handle applying, how do you handle change stream here, uh, changes um, and in DLT, there's a syntax called apply change into a table, which basically converts your CDC type events into either an SCD type 1 or SCD type 2. So for those of you who have to build very complex merge statement to build SCD type tables, this is cool, like seriously cool. But caveat is a view at the end, because we do check for out of order, but it's, it maintains uh, it, 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 it handles the out-of-order events automatically as well, which I think it's you know, pretty neat if you think about the syntax look like that instead of having to write a complete merge statement. You can write a syntax like that to basically go from a CDC logs to an SCD type 1 table. And you can you know, obviously get this change as JSON files, Kafka, you know, Kinesis, and you can apply chains into. I do think it's cool. And um, you can track history, so you can build SCD type 2 as well as part of this. I do think it's cool. This is like the best part, right? Who, who here hates write merges, right? I think everyone hates write upsets and merges. Like, this is awesome. Um, and, you know, you, you can, so just remember, like, a couple of things to remember, you know, your streaming live table are stateful, so it remembers. It's like an elephant. It remembers when you process so far. So if you want to completely redo everything, you do have to full refresh to clear the state. So you know that's one thing that gets a bit annoying if you forget about those. But again, come to me later. We want to talk about streaming. If you want to do aggregation again, you know we want. You might want to do like incremental aggregation. Again, come to me later because a lot of this is like a lot of code. You know we. But when you start talking about streaming, um, this get, you know, I get, we get nervous. Um, we, 
have some, so, so, so this is where you, so these tables would be, so the first table in here effectively is an incremental, is a read stream. Second table, again, it is a read stream, so it'll be incremental, but it has a watermark there and is a group by. And then the last one is a fully recompute. So when you think about it, the first two tables are cheap, the last table is expensive to compute. So when you break it down into three steps like this, you do get a much more economical aggregation rather than trying to aggregate over a full table every single time. And you can do stream, stream, join, and you can stream f join facts with uh, dimensions so that if both of them are arriving near real time or you know, continuously, you can join them as well. The, the, th this is quite common for like app tech, you know, when you've got user impressions and you've got the, uh, um, and those, uh, you've got the, the user impressions and you've got like the click time. Um, and what people usually do is they set a watermark so you drop any late arrival events and you want to buffer that. But you know, that's more like streaming. But DLT just allows you to write the syntax quickly. Um, if you don't specify a watermark, like at the time bound, you will blow up your pipeline. So again, this is where like, it's powerful, but you do need to know this. You're working with unlimited data. It's like if you go to all you can eat buffet, and like if you don't stop, you will die. Uh, GDPR, so you know, can you delete things from a table? Uh, yes, you kind of do that, but then if you do it on the live table, we will undo it because again, we recompute everything from scratch. So you want to do it into, in a streaming live table. And there's a pattern here where you basically do streaming live table and then you get live table at the end. I don't really, I'm not really happy with this. This is good, but this means every live table would be recomputed if you delete something off it. It's not great. Um, so there's a more cool thing, which is called incrementalizations. You know, when your data has changed, how do we do incrementalizations more effectively? And do we append data as it arrives? Do we recompute the whole partition? Or do we merge based on the row that changes? And a lot of this is complicated to reason about. So how do you pick the right technique? And what project we're working on is called Enzyme. So here the joke, Catalyst is a Spark optimizer, Enzyme, next thing. So, you know, haha, there's a tech pun here. I don't see anyone laughing, very sad. But it will pick the, ex it will pick the, the, the optimized um, incremental technique, incrementalization technique, to give you the best update technique. So this is cool. This is, the, we're building techniques by technique but it's coming. Um, and I, I know a lot of people have been asking me that because I think this was announced like, you know, at Summit, they have a, a, an MVP, they have a demo that's working. I'm like, yeah, but that works on, like, on one technique. It's like literally a, a count of everything. I'm like, yeah, that's easy, but think about all the other techniques. But this will change a lot, you know, it would save a lot more cost because this will happen behind the scene. So think of it as like, it's hidden, right? Who here knows much about Catalyst? Not a lot of people want to talk about Catalyst, right? Like, but it just works, it's just the engine. There's some scalability guidelines before I finish. So, you know, we have a limit um, in the workspace, but you can always raise them on request. So, you know, how many pipelines you can have, how many notebooks you can have. But when you're running your pipelines, we're saying, you know, maybe cap out at 100. Don't try to go too more than that, because then you would probably kill your cluster. Uh, if you're doing continuous ingestions, don't try to do, 20, don't try to do more than 25, because you would kill it. And, but, we're going to keep improving this, so don't worry about it. And I think that's basically the last one that I have to talk about, right? I think we talked a lot of things. So your feedback is welcome, obviously, but I think there'll be questions. And um, I guess happy to take a few in the room uh, if there's questions. No? Well, a virtual question, I think, in relation to streaming. Can we implement this solution for batch data? You can. A live table is batch. Stream live tape. So, sorry, the question is can we implement this for batch data, right? And it's like, yes, it is. You can implement it for batch data. And a stream is just incremental. Don't think of stream as like it is stream. So, you can work with batches. And this is just defining the data model. And it will figure out the best strategy to keep your data up to date. I have this table. I have this table as an aggregate of the previous table. That table is another aggregate. This table is a filter of this table. We'll run it in batch, we run it in stream, we run it, you know, with thingy majiggy. With merges, we can build views on top of those. Um, but so think of it as declaring your data model 
and then you can choose how often you want to update, and it would choose batch or stream. So it, again, makes your life a little bit easier. I think uh, that. You know, one last question uh, from online. Um, Spark SQL and basic MS SQL are not exactly the same. Is it intended to make them more similar, or is Spark SQL different with a good reason? So Spark, so question is Spark SQL and T-SQL, I think MS SQL, has diverges. And the main reason, or the, the, the technical reason, is we follow ANSI SQL. So everything that meets ANSI SQL should work on Spark SQL. And I think theoretically T-SQL is ANSI compliant to like maybe one other version. But anything that goes beyond that additional functionality that is not specified in the, uh, in, in the ANSI SQL spec, gets a bit complicated, and, but they're transpiler. So you, if you've got a lot of your T-SQL, there are transpilers there that would transpile that down to a Spark SQL as well. Um, same with, you know, if you've got like Postgres or you've got Oracle, PL SQL, it would does the same thing. So it's kind of, we have, you know, the S in SQL doesn't stand for standard apparently. So we have to live with that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, well, if there's no question left from the room, then I think, uh, you know, thank you very much for attending.